Hey everyone. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I might be late. Um, and so, good morning. Thank you for being here today uh, to worship with us. I'm so glad you're here, and we're excited about uh, the the Lord's Supper service we have um, planned for today. Uh, if you haven't been in our church before, you know that part of what we do at our church is once a month we take one of our services and devote it almost entirely to the Lord's Supper. We think that what Christ has left us to do to remember his death on our behalf is extremely important. And so we are going to take this service, and Brother Andrew, he's going to bring a message in just a little while. The songs, all of it will point to the cross. And so I'm thankful that you're here with us today so that we can celebrate together. Just a reminder, Sunday School classes are available for all ages at 9.30 a.m. And next week's Next week, the teens are back into the fellowship room, but I did have one of the adults ask if they could join us, and so, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, you can't, uh, it's just for the teens. And I think it was just because they got Timbits in that room, and so, no, you have to stay out here without your Timbits. Uh, growth groups are starting this, if they, if they didn't start last week, if your group didn't start last week, it should be starting this week for sure. And if your group doesn't start this week, if there's something seriously wrong. You might not be in a group. Play practice on, is on Tuesday this week at 6.30. So if you have children involved in that, then please be here at 6.30 on Tuesday. Also, the ladies' M&M &M meeting is going to be rescheduled. And before... The announcements are done. I'm pretty sure Tara will tell me what time that is for. She was there. She's not there now. And so we'll wait on her to tell us what day it's get rescheduled for. Um, on Wednesday is the Kids Club. And again, we had our, our Harvest Fest. Thanks to all those who made that possible last week. Uh, this week is at 6.30 to 7.45. And if you can register online, that would be helpful to us. You can do that on Facebook or there's a link on our website. Titus 2 ladies are meeting this Thursday, November the 11th, at 2 p.m. And so if you're a part of that group, uh, and that's the, the, soup, the really wonderful, uh, sweet, mature ladies in our church, then please, if you're not sweet, you could go there and become more sweet. <laughs> but that's on November 11th at 2 p.m. And then youth on Friday, we have Christmas shoebox packing on this Friday, and that's going to start at 7 p.m. So come and come with some money. Bring at least $5. If you want, you can bring more, but you're going to put that money toward buying items for shoeboxes, and your group will, will be able to pack the number of shoeboxes that you've brought money for. And so please come, and this is a great way for us to serve. Uh, on Saturday, another opportunity to serve is the leaf raking event. And Greg said that there was about 100 people that signed up to have their leaves raked and only two people that signed up to do it. <laughs> and so those two people are going to be very busy unless, unless there's some more of you that sign up to say that you will help. And so if, you, if you're able to help, that's great. Please let Greg Dressler know. And if you, and I'm not, I'm not, serious. There wasn't a hundred. So if, if you need your leaves raked, if that'll be a really help to you, then please also see Greg and we'll be able to get a schedule of places to go and groups of people who can tackle that. That is this Saturday at 1 p.m. We'll meet here at the church and then leave from here out to our places. And then there's also a men's breakfast this Saturday at uh, 9 a.m. I think Brother Jeff is bringing the message um, this Saturday. And if you, can, if you want to come to that, please sign up again on our website, or there's a sign-up table on your way out in the welcome room. You can also collect on your way out Samaritan's Purse Christmas shoe boxes. Those are there. We have 200 of them, so we're, we're going big this year. So if you'd like to pick one up, their, their due date is November 21st. It just requires you to pick if you want to do a, a boy or girl, and then different age groups, and then you pack things, and they, there's recommend recommendations of things that would be helpful to them and then you pack it in and bring it back in here before November 21st and we'll make sure we get it to where it's supposed to go. Option one is that you pack your own box and then you bring in and if you can donate ten dollars toward the shipping cost that's helpful. Option two is that we have someone in our church who's willing to pack at least 50 boxes and all you have to do is pay for the shipping costs. 
So we'd like to get at least 50 boxes, the shipping paid for, the $10 paid for, and then you'll know that you've allowed a box to go out. And so those are your two things you can do. Um, continue to pray for Ainsley Mast. I think she's recovering a bit from the, the uh, cold she has, but she has her surgery scheduled at the end of this week, or sorry, at the end of this month. And so pray for her. And then I know Mike Vince has surgery coming on November 9th, and so you can pray for Mike as well. Uh, don't let me forget, I think Mark Hill is coming into membership of our church at the end of this, this service, if you'll have him. And Jacques and Marg Van Dalen are presenting themselves for membership to our church. And so we're super excited about that. They're a wonderful, sweet couple. If you don't know them, you should definitely get to know them. And so we'll announce that for the next two Sundays, and then um, we will hopefully let them in. Also, next week is Baptism Sunday. We have at least eight baptisms scheduled right now. Amen. It's exciting. And if you feel like the Lord is leading you toward baptism and you want to talk to one of the elders about it, please contact me. Let me know after the service or get in contact with us this week. We always meet with the folks that are being baptized. We hear their testimony and why they want to be baptized. And so if you, if you want to get baptized this Sunday, please let us know, and that would be fantastic. Do we have a date for the Titus, the m M&M? meeting? No, we don't. Okay, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna, we'll let, we'll let you ladies know when the day is. I think it's probably next, not next Tuesday, not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, but we're just gonna wait. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, I think that's all my announcements, unless somebody knows that I missed something. Real quick. Titus 2, I, I, I got Titus 2, it's Thursday at 2 p.m. Good. All right. Andrew is going to come forward. He's going to read the scripture reading this morning and then pray for the service. Thank you. Good morning. What a joy and a privilege, privilege it is to gather this morning and to remember the risen Christ. Our scripture reading this morning is Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and it is all about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. So speaking of Christ, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things we might, he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can gather together as men, as women, as boys and girls who follow Christ. And may we remember his sacrifice this morning. May we remember the cross. May we remember the work that was done on the cross. And may we glorify Jesus Christ in that. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, would uh, you stand with us this morning as we come before the throne and worship in song together?
have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took, took it out of the way nailing it to the cross. Justify the blessing. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can gather here this morning. And as your word is opened, may it go forth in power. May the Spirit of God be amongst us and open our eyes to see the beauty and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I would invite you to turn to the book of 1 Timothy, and we'll be looking at the third chapter, verses 14 through 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, and I'm going to go through and read the text, or our text this morning in its entirety. Before we get started. 1 Timothy 3, chapter 3, verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself, thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And, it, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. This is the word of the Lord. There once was an old church in England... A sign on the front of the building read, We preach Christ crucified. After a time, Ivy grew up and obscured the last word. The motto now read, We preach Christ. The Ivy grew some more, and the motto read, We preach. Finally, Ivy covered the entire sign, and the church died. Such is the fate of any church that fails to carry out its mission and proclaim its message in the world. Our text this morning highlights the the mission and the message of the church. It highlights the purpose of the church and the core of what the church is centered around. Let's look again at verse 14 this morning. These things write I unto thee. Well, who is writing? Well, we know that the Apostle Paul has written this letter to Timothy, that he left Timothy at the church in Ephesus, and now he is writing to Timothy, who is in the position of a pastor at the church in Ephesus, and he is instructing him. Timothy was a young man at this time, fairly young to be in a position that he was in, and he was Paul's beloved son in the faith. Paul cared for him, and Paul wanted to give him instructions in how he should structure and order and what to focus on at the church in Ephesus. Paul hoped that he would soon have the opportunity to come and see Timothy in person, but according to our text, he was doubtful that that would happen anytime soon. He says to Timothy, These things I write unto thee. Anytime that we're reading through Scripture and we see something along that line, these things write I unto thee, we should stop and we should ask questions of the text. Of the text, We should not breeze over it. We should want to know what are these things that Paul is writing to Timothy. Well, when we take this verse in context, we can deduce that these things are actually everything that Paul is communicating to Timothy in the book of 1 Timothy. That he is instructing Timothy in how he should order and structure the church in Ephesus. In verse 15, we see the purpose for his writing. Verse 15 says, That thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God. This is what the church is supposed to look like, Timothy. 
Take my instructions and put this church into order. Put structure into the church. This is what you are to focus on. This is your purpose and this is your message. Now, this instruction is not limited solely to the church in Ephesus in the first century, but today in Chatham, Ontario, we can also properly take these verses in context and then understand what this message is for Maple City Baptist Church in 2021. Paul begins here by describing the church in three ways. The first way that Paul describes the church is he describes the church as the house of of God, the house of God. Here we have Paul using a metaphor for the church as a family. And by and large, when we gather here, that's, that's what we are. We are one big family. If you like, we are one big bundle of misfits, all gathered here together to gather around the word of God. In this family, we have God as our father. We have believers in him, in his son, as children in this family. We have elders and deacons and leaders as leaders to help carry out the Father's purposes. There is also an eternal aspect to this family as well. As we grow together in Christ and we look towards eternity. I think this is something that we often forget. We see the here and we see the now and this is what we focus on. Sometimes it's actually quite difficult to stay focused on this, let alone look towards eternity. But the reality is, is that as we grow together in Christ, as we are refined, and as God uses each other to refine the rest of the body, we are growing in Christ. We are growing towards being together forever in eternity. Now in heaven, we will be made perfect. We will be complete the being together part should be an easy business when we're in heaven. But in the here and now, well, it certainly can be more challenging than you may think. There's a poem that you may have heard. It says this. It says, To live above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that's a different story. <laughs> From your body language this morning, I can understand and I can tell that you probably know that to be true. And from the way that you're looking around amongst each other now, I can also tell that you're trying to get a certain someone in mind when you hear that poem read. And considering at Maple City Baptist Church that we are a church that is unified, and for the most part we do think together, and considering here's not, he is not here today, I think we can all agree that that one individual is none other than Rick Dressler. It's just so loud. It's loud, it's loud. <laughs> the truth of the matter, however, we can understand that when church is done right, when the family of God is gathered together and we are unified, it is a beautiful thing. It's beautiful. Contrary to prior experience that you may have had, contrary to what the world says when they look in and they look at church, or organized religion as they maybe would think of it. When the church is done right, although it's not perfect, nor will it ever be on this side of heaven, when the church is unified and our eyes are fixed firmly on the person and work of Jesus Christ, unity is possible. It's not a perfect unity, but it is possible. We must strive to conduct ourselves correctly in the house of God. The second description that Paul uses for the church in these verses and, and this instruction to Timothy, Paul uses the title or uses the description, the church of the living God. The living God. This is a term that is frequently used as a title for God in the Old Testament. And it was used to emphasize the deadness of idols relative to the majesty of and the truth, and the living God that we serve, Yahweh. God is, our God is a God who intervenes in human history. We see him in creation. You just look around outside and you can see the beauty of his creation. We see it in the flood. We see the wrath of God acting in the flood. We see it in the exodus from Egypt. That Pharaoh had no business nor no intention of letting God's people go, and yet God had a different intention. 
We see it in Jericho, where the walls, the mighty walls of Jericho fell. We see it in the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, that they could do nothing to call fire down, and yet God, or Elijah called fire down, and God answered and consumed the sacrifice. But I think we know this morning that the greatest example of the living God intervening in human history is none other than the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. Christ ushers in the new covenant, and we experience the living God working in unexpected ways, here and now. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. It'll be up on the screen in a moment if you don't have your Bible with you. But look what it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. It says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You are the temple of the living God if you have been saved by the blood of Christ. Just stop and think about that for a moment. You are the temple of the living God. When we gather here this morning, the presence of the living God is among us. Together we make up the assembly of the living God. And there is unmeasurable encouragement that comes from this. I would, I would say that especially in a time when things are difficult. That up until now, things haven't been maybe necessarily rosy and easy, but I think that we can all look around and we can understand that things are, are starting to press in upon us, that the church of Jesus Christ from this point forward is going to be increasingly persecuted. And yet when the saints of Jesus Christ gather together in a building such as this on a Sunday morning around the Word of God to proclaim Christ, there is unmeasurable encouragement that comes with that. This is why the Word is adamant in Hebrews 10.25 when the Word says that believers ought to meet together, that we are to gather together. We are not to forsake the gathering of saints. It's no secret that when we were fully online at the start of the pandemic, there was loss there. I think all of you can probably understand that. When we were at home and you had to turn on your computer screen, there was loss there. And certainly some of us today are at home and we're, we're maybe still in, in uh, kind of that setting where we're forced to actually be at home, we're sick for, uh, for various reasons. And the fact that we can do that, it, it is a blessing. But it should never replace the gathering of the people of Jesus Christ. That when we were fully online and there were but a few people here, not that the building is what is important, but the gathering of saints, but when we were fully online, there was something almost tangibly lost. You could almost feel it. That it wasn't the gathering of saints as God had, had intended it to be. I think actually great evidence of this was when we switched to uh, parking lot services when we did the drive-in services. And although that wasn't as, as good as maybe what we can have now, where we can gather together and we can be together, when we went from being fully online to gathering in the parking lot, even that, that, that gathering in the parking lot, although we were in our cars and we were listening on the radio, there was something different about it. There was something just a little bit better about pulling in and seeing the faces of the people that, that you love. When we meet together here, we proclaim the Word of God. We worship together. We pray together. Like this morning, we pr participate in the Lord's Supper together. Next week, we'll celebrate in baptism together. It's a glorious thing. When we fellowship together, we are sanctified to resemble the person of Jesus Christ. And what an encouragement that is. It's such an encouragement to come here and to see brothers and sisters in Christ. To see little children memorize scripture. To see children come to faith in Christ. To see elderly saints get up in the morning and although it's difficult for them to come here, they make a commitment to do so. As I was preparing this week, I was, as, as interesting as it may sound to you, as I was preparing this week, I was encouraged by Jim Rutherford. 
you don't, are not familiar with Jim Rutherford, Jim Rutherford went to be with his Savior on January 14th of this, this year. And I was encouraged by Jim Rutherford. Jim had a, a whole host of books. He had a library. And I, I, got to, I got most of them. And as I was preparing this week, I was flipping through some of the books that Jim had given me. And I was looking specifically at some commentary in this text. And as I opened Jim's book, I saw underlining. And I saw writing in the margins. And it was beautiful to interact with Jim Rutherford, although he's not here anymore. I felt like I was interacting with him in what he saw in this text this morning. That when we are a household of God, when we are the house of the living God, we gather together, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Next in our passage, or next in our text this morning, we're going to see both the mission and the message of what the church is here for revealed. The next thing that Paul calls the church, or the next description he uses for the church, is that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So if we are to gather here, if we're a family, and we gather here consistently, what are we to gather around? What is the center? What is the purpose for our coming here? Well, we gather together on the Lord's day, and we are unified around the person and work of Jesus Christ. But what is described as, or what is described by, the pillar and the ground of the truth? Here Paul uses architectural language to describe the church. The church is the ground or the foundation of truth. That is quite a title if you think about it. Especially today, considering the fact that the whole world looks at the idea of truth and kind of balks at it. But we have the truth, and the church is the ground and foundation of it. The church is also described as the pillar of truth, that we uphold the truth. But again, what truth are we grounded in? What are we to uphold? Well, look at John 17, 17. I think that it summarizes it concisely and beautifully. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The church is God's chosen agent to uphold the Word of God. The Word of God must be central. As a church and as an individual, both corporately and individual this morning, we are to go to the Word of God to understand what is expected of us. How are we to structure this church? What are we to put in place to make the church function? How are we to stay unified in this church? And then individually, at home, how are we to govern our households? How are we to treat our wife or our husband? How are we to treat our, our, our children? Right? We are to go to the Word of God. The Word of God allows us to be thoroughly equipped and ready for every good word. The Word of God is so, so important. If you have your Bible again, please turn with me real quickly to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. I want you to see something that's extremely important in these verses. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what should we see from these two verses this morning? Well, first of all, we should see, and I think that it's safe to say that all of us here in this room, for the most part, would agree wholeheartedly and completely that the Word of God is inerrant, that it is without error, that God has inspired and used men to perfectly record what He has for us. The Word of God is inerrant. But let's go to the second part of it this morning, because the second part of it, well, although I think we would agree that it's true, you need to actually take a look and measure, do I actually live this out? In verse 17, it says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Not only is the word of God inerrant, the word of God is also sufficient in our lives for all things. And while we would agree, I believe, this morning that that is true, 
I want you to ask yourself really quickly this morning and think about it the rest of this week. Am I living that out? I am ready to proclaim and I'm ready to agree that the Word of God is inerrant. I am convinced and I believe that. But am I convinced and do I believe and do I live out the fact that the Word of God is sufficient? That for every area of my life, I can go to the Word of God and find what I need. How I treat my wife. Am I treating my wife based upon what the scriptures say? Or am I treating my wife by something I saw out of, movie, out of a movie two years ago? And I thought, hey, that actually seems like a fairly good idea. I might try that. Or how am I treat my kids? How, am I, how I instruct my kids? How I bring up my kids? Am I going to the word of God and am I looking to it in order to find out what is expected of me? Or again, am I looking somewhere else? It's a challenge this morning, but it's extremely important. The church is the pillar and ground of truth, and we must hold up the Word of God. This is our mission. Now let's look to verse 16 to get what the message of the church must be. Verse 16 says, And without great... Con or, sorry, and without controversy, great is the mystery of God. Sorry, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. The mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness. Whenever Paul uses the term mystery, he is referring to Christ as the key to God's hidden plan of salvation. That in Genesis 3, we have sin enter the world. It's beautiful reading Genesis 1 and 2, isn't it? It's so glorious. And then you turn the page and you get to Genesis 3 and the disaster of sin entering the world. And not only was that a disaster for Adam and Eve, but that sin, the sin of the first Adam was imputed to us. So that now when you, you, you look in that little baby carriage <laughs> and you see that little baby smiling up at you, although they may look cute, it's a sinful human being. We are fallen human beings. And the only answer to that, the only way that salvation was going to be offered was through a Messiah. A Messiah was needed. All throughout the Old Testament, they looked forward to a coming Messiah. And when he did come, he came in a way that no one expected. He did not come as a conquering hero. He did not come as somebody that would completely and utterly crush the Roman Empire. Although just a few generations later, he had actually turned it upside down. But he came in a way that no one expected. He was manifest in the flesh. God became flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Christ was willing to completely empty himself to take the form of a servant and put on flesh. I love what it says. The incarnation demonstrates the humility of God. That God was willing to take notice of the most glorious things of heaven. That that is what he stepped out of. And he was willing to humble himself to the point to experience the most lowly things of this earth. That is humility. That is true humility. The Lord Jesus made the invisible God visible in the eyes of man. Great is the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. Next, he was justified in the Spirit. Other translations uh, would, would render this uh, vindicated in the Spirit. Vindicated or, or justified. It means to be declared righteous or to be justified before the Father. Christ was justified in the Spirit. And I think that we see this to a certain extent in Matthew 3.17 as Jesus comes out of the water from his baptism. And the heavens open and the Spirit descends upon him like a dove. And then we hear the mighty voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But what was the means by which Christ would ultimately be justified in the Spirit? Again, it was a way that nobody expected. 
start to understand that that's how God operates. It was a way that nobody expected. That Christ came as a baby, that he grew up, he lived a perfect life, and he submitted himself and humbly went to none other than a Roman cross. Christ was the sacrifice needed for the atonement of sin. If Christ was not justified in the Spirit, all those who believe in the name of Christ would still be dead in our trespasses in sins. Christ was the Messiah that went to die, and Christ was the only Messiah that could go and die and atonement of sins be made. That when his blood was spilled, it was spilled for the remission of sins. It was only possible through Christ. Next we see that it was seen by angels. Christ was seen by angels all throughout his ministry. The angels saw and observed and attended to Christ. They were at his birth announcing it to Joseph and the shepherds. They ministered to him at his temptation after the devil left him. An angel appeared and strengthened him in the garden of Gethsemane before he would go to suffer and die on a cross. An angel would roll away the stone at the door of his tomb. And angels appeared to the woman affirming that he had risen. All throughout Christ's ministry, angels have been involved. And the angels long to look into the things in which we have seen and we have heard proclaimed. Next, he was preached among the Gentiles. Before his ascension, Christ's final command in Matthew 28, 19 to 20 was, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. There is to be no nation left in the world in which the gospel of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed. And by God's grace, we have missionaries working all over the world today, bringing the gospel of Christ, working in the name of Christ. But this morning, I want you to think about our location here in this world. That there are people in Chatham, Ontario in 2021 that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed. That we are responsible to preach unto the Gentiles. We are responsible to go and to bring the message and the truth of Christ. To proclaim Christ crucified to people that do not know him. Next, he was believed on in the world. When the word of God goes out, it does not return void. It does not return void. We see that in Isaiah 55. And we see at the first public preaching of the gospel of Christ, after Christ's resurrection, some 3,000 people were saved. And in the day that, days that followed, thousands more put their faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel does not return void. You can be sure of that. You can also be sure that the gospel is going to offend. And when you take the gospel and you proclaim it, when you live it, and when you speak it to those who do not know it, it will divide. They will either be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God and see the truth on it and place their faith and repent, place their faith in Christ and come to the Lord, or they may turn your nose up, their their nose up at you completely. Either way, the gospel does not return void. Finally, he was received up into glory. I don't think any other passage in Scripture really... Uh, encap- encapsulates what this means better than Philippians 2, 9 to 11. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there now. To be honest, I find that, that when I read this passage of Scripture, when I read these verses, I, I, I almost want to shout them. I almost want to start to sing them because they're just so glorious. That Christ was received up into glory and he was exalted by the Father. Philippians 2, 9 to 11 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That when Jesus was finished his work here on earth, 
when he had paid the penalty for our sins, when he had suffered both his physical beatings and torture, when he had suffered the mockery that he experienced, but even more so, after he suffered the pain of having his father turn his back on the very Son of God, he was received up into glory. He got the due for the submission and the perfection with which he lived out his mission here on earth. This is why we are here. This is our mission, to hold up and to support the truth of God's word and to proclaim the message of Christ crucified. This is why we are here. And it is imperative that we understand that. And so as we gather together for communion this morning, as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, of his submission to the Father, of the perfect life that he lived, and of this willingness to go and die for men and women, for boys and girls who are fallen, let us remember the beauty of Christ crucified. I'll invite the men up this morning to come, uh, and we are about to partake in the Lord's Supper, but as they come up and before we do, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have today to come before you and to remember the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, that there was no other being, both heavenly and earthly, that could pay the penalty for sin that Jesus Christ paid, that in Christ we have atonement for our sin, that his body was broken and his blood was shed, and we thank you that we can look and we can remember. May we understand, Father, as a church, that we are to be unified, that we are to hold up, to be the ground and the pillar of truth. That is our mission. And may we also understand that the message that we are centered around is the message of Christ crucified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We gather together this morning to remember with gratitude the death of Jesus, to celebrate in the life he has given us, and to participate united with our church family in the unity of the body of Christ in anticipation of the day when Jesus will come again. And so we invite all those who have been saved by grace through faith alone and since the time of their conversion have been baptized by immersion to join us in celebrating the Lord's Supper with us. You have your uh, cup and you have uh, your uh, little uh, bread here. I invite you to just kind of maybe peel the, the top layer off uh, and, and to prepare for uh, partaking. In 1 Corinthians 11.24, it says, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Brother Dennis, will you pray for the bread this morning? Our Father, in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you this morning. We can remember the bread that speaks of his body there. The body that went all the way to the cross, the body that was humiliated, he was smote upon, he was spit upon, hairs were plucked from his face. And as he was cruelly beaten and as he hung there on the cross those hours, and he was unrecognizable, the scripture tells us. Mm -hmm. By face eye, we look back and we see him bleeding and dying in our room instead. And even when he gave up that ghost with a victory cry, saying it's finished, that body was spear pierced. Oh Lord, may we just look back and see what you've done for us so that we could have eternal life. We just thank you for this bread. In his name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body. Eat and remember.
1 Corinthians 11.25 reads, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pastor Dan, would you pray for the cup this morning? Father, Lord, I thank you that we have been invited to this table. And God, we recognize that we are sinners. We are rebels of God. We are, we are not holy in and of ourselves, Lord. We, we have no right to be invited to a table of a perfect and pure and holy God. But Lord, that you sent your Son and that his death was substitutionary for us, Lord, that he died in our place, that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And God, I just thank you that you have made a sinner a son. Lord, I thank you that you've given us garments white and clean. And Lord, that we don't stand here, we don't come to this table now as enemies of God, but as children of God at our Father's table because of what Christ has done. And this, this juice, as we drink it, Lord, we just remember the blood of Christ and the cost. Lord, that he sweat drops of blood and then he went to the cross and had his back torn apart and his, his hands and his feet pierced and blood ran down his forehead and, and all. That he bled for us. And God, I thank you for the amazing gift, the amazing sacrifice that was made. And we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 26, 27, Jesus said, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink and remember. May we leave here today remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. May we leave here today living our life in light of the cross. May we leave here today motivated to live a life pleasing to Jesus Christ. That in and of ourselves we have nothing to offer. But through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ that we are being made more and more every day into him, his image. And may we just... Just revel in that truth. We're going to conclude this morning with a hymn. If you can stand, we're going to sing together the power of the cross.
glorious truth in that song. We are forgiven at the cross, and we should live in light of that. Just before you go today, I do want to recognize that on November the 11th, this Thursday, is Remembrance Day, and I know that we live in a time where we are decrying the loss of some freedoms that we used to enjoy, but if we step back from all of this, we recognize that we are so blessed to live in a country like Canada where we can complain about a few of our freedoms taken away because it's just a few and we've got a lot and and so we do we're blessed to live in the country that we live in and we have a lot to be grateful for we men and women who served in the past have fought for our freedoms and we are so grateful for that and I know there's folks in our church who have been a part of that and, and whether they served themselves or had a spouse or a family member a father who served or a mother who served um, we are so thankful for your service and for, um, for just the fact that we get to live in the country we live. So thank you, and um, yes, remember this week that, that we should not just take the freedoms we ha have for granted. I also want to let you know that we are welcoming Mark Hill into membership at our church. Where's Mark at, though? Mark, come on up. Everybody will see you. You don't have to come all the way up here. You just stand, up, stand here at the front. So Mark has been coming to our church for a number of years, but he's been coming primarily on like to, to prayer meetings on Wednesdays and, and to growth groups. And Mark is an incredibly kind, kind man. And so you should get to know him if you don't know him already. Uh, but it's been more recent that he's been coming every Sunday. Uh, I think he's kind of decided to put roots down here in Chatham. And so we're glad for that. And so if you'd like to have Mark as a part of our membership, let it be known by saying good hearty amen. amen. Anybody opposed? Nobody? <laughs> uh, so we're grateful for that, and we'll look forward to others coming in the future. But thank you, Mark, and thank you all for being a part of the service today. God bless you.